to our collective blockchain party, day two of Uber Connect 2020. We've got an exciting program today that goes deep into crypto, specifically the digital asset XRP. We've got some terrific international guests, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce your names correctly. First up, Yuichi Ikeda, Kyoto University, will discuss an analysis of monthly transactions on the XRP ledger followed by a discussion and analysis of broader valuations of different crypto currencies from R.K. Shayama Sunder and Kenichi Ueda. Then we're going to shift to the fight against COVID-19 and hear from a collaboration of various Uber Eats researchers, including Jane Thomason, Chardon Kapkin, Java Hugh, and Horst Trabelmeier on how this technology is being leveraged in times of crisis. Their conversation could not be more timely. Then we'll return to crypto. We're gonna get a workshop about testing frameworks for the XRP ledger that will have broader applicability with Brett Mollen, Javier Romero, Clisto, Christo Doulas, and Mitchell Osthorn. We'll get a demo on the latest features of RippleNet and on-demand liquidity with Cassie Craddock. And to round out the show, Pla Huen, Colin Chan Hui Q, Ku Wu Zhei from National University of Singapore FinTech Club will discuss the adoption and sustainability of blockchain Based digital assets. There's so much information over the next few days, so don't forget to ask your questions in the chat so that our presenters has time to answer before their session's over. Okay, enjoy the show. Take it away, Professor Akita. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuichi Kena, uh, Kyoto University. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to the organizer uh, to have uh, this uh, great uh, uh, conference today. Okay, so I'd like to explain today uh, the complex network analysis of XRP transactions. So, uh, as you know, a blockchain technology can help uh, solve various global problems known as uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, among these goals, uh, international remittances by uh, mi migrants to their home countries are especially important. Uh, in uh, today's uh, presentation, we revealed that the reality of financial transaction network of XRP from network science perspective. We characterize the entire transaction network by drawing on various centrality features used in network science. Okay, so this slide shows the basic uh, countings. The data include the, uh, from 2013 to the middle of 2016. The number of the transactions and source of and this number of source, and number of destinations are shown in this uh, table. So as you as you notice, uh, the number of the transaction uh, will uh, uh, steadily increase. Okay. So then the, I'd like to explain the basic concept of complex network. Uh, in network, in complex network, uh, 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 we we show the node in this circle. Okay, so, and um, also uh, the relationship between nodes are represented by these links. Okay, so all links has weight and directions. Uh, okay, so in this case, weight is the amount of transaction and direction is, uh, uh, is made from source to destination, which means the flow of XRP. Okay, so for example, uh, in this figure, uh, for example, for node C, uh, uh, we calculate uh, in degree, which is uh, 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 incoming, number of the incoming uh, node is equal to two. Similarly, uh, the number of the uh, uh, outgoing uh, node, uh, outgoing links is called out degree is equal to uh, one. Okay, so total uh, degree is equal to three in this case. In a similar way, uh, we can define the strength. Uh, for node C, uh, uh, the sum of the weight for the incoming uh, links are equal to 25. That is uh, in strength. Uh, similarly, uh, 
out strength is equal to 30. The total uh, amount, total strength is 55. Okay, so in this way, we, we can uh, characterize each node. Okay, so um, I show, I show uh, here uh, the, the uh, rank size plot, which, uh, which is identical to the cumulative uh, distribution. Uh, in complementary cumulative distribution. So you can recognize that the uh, straight section for the tail of the distribution. In this plot, uh, both x and y axis are in log scale. So this straight section means that the uh, uh, power law distribution. So, so, okay. so this network was made for the uh, uh, on the uh, in the September uh, 2019. Okay, so this uh, network uh, shows the uh, power law distribution for out uh, strength distribution for in strength distribution. This means that the network is uh, is uh, is categorized as a, a scale-free network. Okay, so the uh, so the storage section, the slope of the storage section is characterized by parameter gamma. The parameter is called the power law index. So I show here the temporal change of power law index um, for the, for the uh, entire period. Okay, so you can recognize that the power law indices uh, vary in the vicinity of one or both in and out uh, strengths. This uh, means that uh, we network is clearly a uh, scalable network. Okay, so next slide is an uh, explanation of network centrality measure. Uh, in this slide, I explain six centrality measures. One is uh, in degree centrality, defined by this equation. The next one, next is uh, out degree centrality, defined by this. And the third one is the average short, shortest path length. For each uh, pair of nodes, we can calculate the shortest path length. So then we uh, average, make uh, average for the shortest path length. So that is uh, indicated by this d, small d. The next one is a clustering coefficient, which is uh, the probability uh, that your neighbors are friend each other. Okay, so if this quantity is, is large, uh, close to one, your uh, neighbors are, are friend each other. Okay, the next one is assortativity or degree correlation. If this is this quantity is uh, close to one, a big node transact with big node, and small node with will transact with small node. In contrary, if this quantity is negative, a big node transact with small node. Okay, so this, so in this sense, this quantity is very in, uh, important. The last one is uh, entropy uh, calculated based on a uh, degree uh, information. Okay, so I will show the result. Uh, first one, first, uh, this slide shows uh, in and out degree centrality. Uh, uh, actually, temporal change of this quantity for the entire period. Okay, so you can recognize that the out, uh, uh, out degree is larger than in degree. Out degree is uh, uh, around 0.3 or so, but in degree centrality is uh, close to uh, less than one, uh, uh, less than uh, 0.1 or so. So the this means that the difference, uh, this difference shows that each node pays many nodes and receive from a few on average. Okay, so then next one is a path length and clustering coefficient. Uh, for the path length, uh, you can see that the, the, the value is close to six or so for the entire period. And, but clustering coefficient uh, for from middle of 2014 to the end of 2016, you can see that the 
uh, value is about 0 0.4 or so. So for just for this period, um, large clustering coefficient and small path lengths. So that means the network shows a small world nature or small world characteristics. Okay, but but we don't know the reason why the clustering coefficient is large just for this period. Okay, this is not no. The, the reason is not known. Okay, so the next slide shows the assortativity and entropy. Assortativity is consistently negative. So uh, this means that the big node transacts with small node. Okay, this is an important characteristic. Big, big rich uh, node with large uh, XRP transact with uh, ordinary small uh, people. Okay, so this is interesting. <laughs> Okay, so last one is uh, uh, entropy, uh, but we don't see any uh, sig significant change in entropy. So, so this, so th these are the entire uh, character characteristics. But among these characteristics, we should pay attention to the uh, large clustering coefficient uh, in in a certain period because the uh, cluster, large clustering coefficient. Uh, is somewhat uh, strange for the for this kind of financial uh, transaction because uh, this means that uh, you are a neighbor uh, transact each other. Okay, so we need to clarify the reason for this. Uh, this for to to to, cli to clarify uh, the reason, I plot the relationship between uh, amount of the number of transactions. So the, the upper panel show that the scatter plot between the total transaction and the number of the transactions. Okay, so uh, in this case, a boundary shows the clear proportionality, but underneath of the uh, this pro pro proportional proportionality, uh, you can see that the all uh, many transactions uh, are shown here. Okay, so to clarify. Uh, to understand this situation, I plot uh, uh, the number of, a histogram of the number of transactions. Uh, first, left, left, leftmost uh, panel shows uh, the histogram of number of transactions for all nodes. And you can recognize that the many nodes transact just a few times, mostly uh, once, just once. This big node shows uh, just uh, one transaction. Okay, uh, so all, many nodes, almost uh, many nodes transact a very uh, small number a uh, uh, few, few, few times. Okay, so the right uh, most panel shows a uh, uh, similar plot, but for the uh, top 300, largest 300 node. So in this case, we can see that the consider considerable uh, uh, Share of transaction, uh, uh, la, la, uh, con large uh, number of the transaction here, and but me, uh, be between these two extreme cases, uh, that is for the top one thousand uh, node, uh, it, when we uh, this this plot shows that uh, uh, we have two peaks here and here. Okay, so this is. Uh, somewhat strange. Uh, in the transaction among top major node, a characteristics behavior is observed. I call this peaks the uh, intermediate transaction peaks. Okay, so we have to understand the reason why we have this kind of peaks. Okay, so to understand the result, uh, I did a motif, network motif analysis. Uh, especially uh, network, motif, network motifs are small Topological patterns such as uh, tri triangular subgraph that recur in the network significantly more often uh, than expected by chance. Okay, so for three node uh, motif, we have uh, 16 motif. Okay, so but uh, 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 just uh, motif nine, uh, uh, sorry, motif eight, nine, and 12 to 16 has. Uh, a real triangular uh, motif with 
three uh, links. The other motifs has uh, uh, just two links, one links, or no links. Okay, so we have to uh, pay attention to the real tri triangular motifs. Okay, so I show you the uh, results briefly. This, these are the a number of motif uh, divided by number of nodes in top 300 networks. Okay, so for the uh, motif with two links, uh, this one, motif three has is, is, is abundant. Okay, but uh, uh, real triangular motif such as a motif eight is uh, small, least actually. And similarly, a motif uh, nine, nine is this. We have, we observed some uh, motif, but least. Okay, so similarly, motif uh, 12 to uh, 16. These motifs are least. Okay, so this is, this is a, a very interesting result. And this is consistent to the uh, histogram of transaction. Numbers of, numbers of transactions I showed you before. Okay, so, but we have to understand the, the intermediate, intermediate peak uh, observed in top 1,000 networks. So I did the same uh, analysis for uh, one, top, top 1,000 networks. But in this case, uh, we have a fairly uh, large uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, this kind of clear increase uh, for motif 14 and 16. In the uh, period of 2000, middle of uh, 2014 to the end of 2016, this is a, this period is is same to the uh, period. The uh, large clustering coefficient was observed. Okay, so the increase of the motif six. 14 and 16 is consistent with the uh, large clustering coefficient. Okay, so intermediate transaction peaks might be originated by the increase of motif 14 and 16. But okay, so but uh, uh, we have to uh, we have to uh, 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 think about the limitation of the uh, ordinary uh, network representation because. Uh, the result I show you today is for the network uh, in the, uh, made, made in each um, monthly network. Okay, so um, so my 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 uh, my understanding is that the, the monthly network is time window of one month is little uh, too long. So we have to shorten the time window and uh, to to do the same analysis. Okay, so currently that kind of analysis is uh, in progress. Uh, here is a, a summary of the of today's my presentation. Okay, so uh, we characterize the entire transaction network by drawing the various centrality measure used in network science. Now here is a, the list of the obtained summary. Okay. So uh, we have three more ongoing projects. One is uh, actually student project. Student project that is uh, they are going to develop a blockchain system to manage to buy and sell the right to use electricity uh, among students staying in the in our dormitory. Okay, so this is a, a first project. The second one is uh, as I mentioned before, there is a limitation of the uh, ordinary network uh, uh, representation. So, so, uh, so clarify, to clarify this uh, issue, uh, Professor Aoyama is doing currently the new, uh, studying the new network representation of the network. Okay, so the third one is a uh, uh, si uh, similar uh, analysis, but for the Bitcoin uh, network. Okay, so well, finally, I'd like to uh, briefly mention that uh, uh, we established the Social Innovation Center in Kyoto University. Uh, in this center, uh, the blockchain research area is uh, established uh, among four areas. 
Okay, so we conduct mathematical research on blockchain technology to build a decentralized and open information research and work with students as a form of project-based research to develop a social implementation of solution to global problems. Okay, thank you very much for listening my, my, listening my presentation. Uh, I thank to all participants. Okay, so next uh, speaker is uh, RK Shama Sander. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yuichi Ikeda, for a nice talk on the network uh, connected with the Ripple. So now I am going to be uh, taking into a new session, which is predicting volatility in the currency in the uh, market of the Ripple network. So the, there will be two speakers, myself, who will be followed by Professor Ueda from Japan. So the goal is to build a model to realize stable currency because currency volatility is an important factor in the choice of a stable currency. Unpredictable movement of exchange rates of currency is undesirable. And now for this reason, using approaches that have been used for fiat currency, we will build a model for analysis and prediction of fluctuations or accuracy for cryptocurrencies. It enables taking advantage of its foreseeable volatility. So what is the rationale? So if you go back, you look at the fiat currencies of sovereign nations, they are all regulated and governed by respective central banks. A stable currency is preferred as a conduit to move other currencies across sovereign boundaries. Movement of money requires the conversion of source currency into a stable currency by a conversion from a stable currency to the destination currency. Of course, there are well-established networks like SWIFT that facilitate movement of money across nations that will help at least one stable uh, through the help of at least one stable currency. When multiple stable currencies are involved in the movement of money, each of the currency in the basket affects the final amount represented in destination currency. Thus, it is very necessary to identify factors that affect exchange rates of currency. It could be periodic, it could be asymmetric, that means it affects only one side of the currency pair and associative when it affects the, uh, both the sides of the currency pair. So now you may ask questions, is it only for currencies or it is also there for commodities and assets? Models to forecast volatility are not limited only to the financial market. It's also used in demand oriented assets like electricity, gas, oil, using the empirical properties over a range of univariate and multivariate GARP models. Cryptocurrencies, unlike the fiat currencies, also limit the supply of currency as is the case with the natural resources like oil and gas and that's in the uh, literature what we can find is intraday rates provide the most accurate forecast for one day or one week forecast horizons while implied volatilities are at least as accurate as the historical forecast for one to three month horizon. Evolution in the number of Google internet searches for particular keywords can also predict volatility in the market of foreign uh, currency. What is the approach we take? We try to get the uh, get ARIMA, which is the autoregressive integrated uh, uh, moving, to get a rough estimate of the parameters of ARIMA prediction. A good starting point is of course ACF and also PACF and to get a statistical significance of empirically selected ARIMA parameters, we use AIC, BIC and HQIC tests as well. The aim of these tests is to find parameters that show a model with the lowest value of the selected information criteria. So now just coming a little bit how we get the data. 
we have the Ripple Center for Excellence in Blockchain at IIT Bombay. And cryptocurrencies are based upon open networks for movement and are all uh, ledger based where each participant has an account and performs either a send or a receive operation and each of these operations are publicly validated and written into the global ledger where every other participant can either accept or reject an incoming operation based on the state of the global public ledger. XRP network is a semi-public ledger based solution for currency movement. At IIT Bombay, we run one of the trusted nodes as a validator for the Ripple network. In addition, we also maintain another server to record full history of all transactions floating on the network. That means we have a full copy of the ledger allows us to carry out our investigation on the major currencies being used on this network. For example, if you look at the chart where I have shown, it consists of the volume of the daily transactions for the Bitcoin in the Ripple network from 1st July 2019 to 31st December 2019. So now Dickey Fuller test and KPSS test are done to check for stationarity and we also use log differencing for making them stationary if they are not as you can see from the charts that are depicted. <clears throat> and so this one shows the results of the Fuller uh, test on the XRP for the uh, Bitcoin, the US dollar uh, and uh, the again another set for the US dollars. So these are the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function plots for this uh, data set. And now what is the thing we need to do? We need to test for skewness. And to see if the residual in our ARIMA model is not skewed, we need to plot the residual and compare it with the Gaussian distribution, which is also shown later, which I will show you. The mean and the standard deviation come out to be 0 0.08 and 2.52. And also we plot the Gaussian distribution with dotted line with the same mean and standard deviation for comparison. And now if you observe for this, this is the Gaussian distribution, which is the residual distribution and comparison with the Gaussian distribution and now here you can see when we plot Gaussian distribution with dotted line with the same mean and standard deviation we can observe that the mean is around 0 and the distribution is similar to the uh, Gaussian distribution. Thus we can conclude that the uh, residual is not skewed and hence the model is a good fit as you can see in the predicted values uh, along with the ground truth and this is the one which I already showed Gaussian distribution with the residual distribution and to summarize the model we have uh, uh, derived is very useful in predicting volatility of the prominent currencies and it shows that it is not just the speed of transmission for which people who recollect the UBI, uh, UBRI connect last time when uh, Raghurajan, Raghurajan who was also the ex-RBI governor uh, said about the speed at which it happens but also the stability also we have shown such a property can be effectively used in the Ripple's XRP network for correcting transaction ordering flaws leading to temporary volatility in the network identifying source of volatility by checking whether the volatility in XRP is following the volatility in other stable currencies and preventing this also leads to preventing exploitation of the Ripple's network. For example, we have a, a few trusted users from the unique node list that is the URL that can take advantage of predicting the volume and blocking or slowing down the network. And the, uh, to conclude, you know, this also we started to say whether India could also be uh, said that it would be nice if lots of people who stay outside India, they can also send money through the Ripple network most effectively. This is also one of the effects that uh, was uh, done uh, through this experiment. Uh, thank you for your listening and if you have any questions feel free to uh, send me by email which is mentioned on my uh, slide and also on the legend or you can also send me via chat I will be responding to you on the chat itself and the uh, next person who is going to be talking on the similar topic is the professor Ueda from Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Shimasunda, uh, for introducing me. Uh, my name is Kenichi Ueda, teaching at the University of Tokyo. 
Uh, this is joint work with Toranosuke Onishi, who is working at Tokyo Marine and Insurance Company. Our talk is about price stability of crypto assets. Price stability is important for more people to use crypto assets as a medium of exchange money. Also, from a regulatory viewpoint, which I am more like specialized in, price stability is key to categorize crypto assets, either something like currencies, financial assets, or objects of speculative trades. If we look at crypto assets daily price movement in 2019, which is appear in the right side in the graph, as you see, it is very volatile. This is, I, we, we just uh, uh, put it there in uh, several major uh, crypto assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and so on. And then compared with gold, XAU. As you see, it's volatile. However, at the same time, we see a little bit uh, characteristics. Uh, for example, crypto assets can move together, as you see there. And indeed, uh, if we do some statistical uh, study on this uh, movement, uh, we see there is an underlying common factor, which we call the principal component, uh, that captures about 30% for overall movement of each uh, major crypto asset. And it captures more than 80% if the movement is very big. That is appearing in this picture. So left-hand side, it's a circle picture showing that, as I said, about 0.3, 30% of each uh, Bitcoins, XRP, Ripple, Stella, uh, and so on, about 30% are explained by common latent underlying factor. That means quite co-moving together. On the right-hand side, uh, showing, sorry, a little bit on the Japanese there, in the y-axis is about uh, common factors contribution to the movement and the x-axis about uh, size of the daily movement so that the blue one showing uh, when the movement like this up and down is one stardom deviation below meaning that we, we have w one year daily uh, movement right and then we calculate the variance and standard deviation based on that and then one standard deviation, smaller than one standard deviation means like smaller movement in a year. So in a smaller movement days, uh, it is indeed about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 common factor uh, contributing that movement. So it's not, it's co-moving, but not so much. However, between one standard deviation, one sigma, and two sigma, with two standard deviation, a little bit middle level movement, it's an orange one. And also larger than that, above two standard sigma, two standard deviation movement, big movements. In this big uh, and biggest movement, we see common factor explaining 80% and 90% respectively. Meaning that uh, if there is a big change in the price of crypto assets, uh, this major crypto assets price move uh, almost exactly the same way. That means something uh, there, uh, we see something there that it's not just volatile, but there's some characteristic uh, trends uh, we see there. And we can actually view it as, as, as long as we, we, we focus on the major crypto assets, we could see they are quite cross uh, substitute in terms of price movements. So people can kind of uh, believe the variation for major crypto assets for almost the same way in, in this six or seven at least uh, crypto assets. So the next question is uh, more like uh, not just a comparison among several uh, 
uh, crypto assets, but we focus on one, which is Bitcoin, because we have lots of data of Bitcoin. But we, as, as, as I said, for the major movements, it's a Ripple or Bitcoin or Ethereum, it must be the same. Uh, co movements anyway so for the bitcoin uh, here I, I just showed an example uh, the problem uh, is what is valuation we still see it's a quite a lot of daily valuation changes uh, however in any price movement uh, you see the little up and down and then big kind of wave like up and downs there and for most of the people what is important is uh, st stability of valuation in little bit more long term it's not second by second uh, stability or minute by minute stability but perhaps the stability in uh, one week or one month or perhaps even more so that's uh, something like we want to focus on here we can use some other statistical or econometrical method to uh, separate and decompose into high frequency uh, daily or minute uh, by minute uh, frequency movement from uh, more bigger movements, like s more smoothed out one. Which uh, there are lots of ways to do it. We, we just used the uh, most uh, kind of recent frontier version, which is. Uh, proposed by Mueller and Watson 2018 paper uh, in Econometrica. And then we find out if we just uh, somehow filtered out uh, high frequency one and just looking at big movements, then that's uh, in the uh, uh, rightmost uh, column says about 60%. This 0 0.6. What this means is that. Uh, uh, and M means, by the way, it's three, five, eight, ten means it's a three-day window, five-day window, eight-day window, some some kind of not minute by minute, a little bit longer uh, window. We see anywhere uh, it's about sixty percent co movement with S and P five hundred. S and P five hundred, as you know, it's a major stock index in the U.S. and then it's already averaging out of the uh, underlying uh, stock by stock. So it's already quite smoothed out uh, index. So meaning that uh, Bitcoin or any other major crypto assets valuation, as long as we focus on a big wave, it's quite uh, stable, as stable as I would say S&P 500. So the uh, key point I want to say is that uh, the stability of crypto assets is much more than you think. Thank you for listening. And uh, next we have a panel on blockchains. Welcome to our panel on technology relief in times of crisis and what an appropriate topic that is for today. We have a fantastic panel for you between uh, Austria, Switzerland, Australia and London. So let, I'm Dr. Jane Thomason here in Australia and let me ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So Jawa. Yes, hi everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Jawa Shu. Um, I am a research associate at Center for Blockchain Technologies um, at University College London, and I'm right on campus, <laughs> outside of the classroom, um, where I'll be teaching uh, blockchain technologies and smart contract coding in literally 20 minutes. Thank you, Sergeant. Let Jane. me invite you to introduce yourself. So I'm Sergeant Chapkun. I'm uh, I'm a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich, and uh, I work in security, mainly system security, and I cover topics such as blockchains and uh, distributed sec system security. So, thank you, Horst. Thank you, Jane. My name is Horst Rebelmeier. I'm a professor and uh, the head of Department of International Management at Modul University Vienna, 
and I've been researching the implications of blockchain technologies for about three or four years now, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Yes, thank you. It's going to be a terrific panel, and we're going to be thinking about uh, technology in times of crisis, both in relation to COVID, because that's very topical, but also thinking about humanitarian settings. So by way of introduction, one of the things that we have seen during the pandemic is rapid acceleration of technology of various kinds, including blockchain. We've seen it in terms of data, data management, sharing of data so that we can see what's happening in the pandemic. We've seen it with blockchain in supply chains when we had um, fake supplies of PPE equipment that were uncovered and so people have been using blockchains in their supply chains. We've seen it in remote care, we've seen it in credentialing of medical practitioners and we've seen it particularly in cash transfers all around the world because people need to get money. Then we also have humanitarian settings because even though COVID has taken our attention, there's still over 70 million people who are displaced in the world today. And technology is being used in so many ways to be able to help and manage people in, in refugee and humanitarian settings, including identity, cash transfers, supply chain, um, the visibility and, and transparency of donor fund transfers, addressing slavery in modern supply chains who are often trafficked people who are displaced, um, and in asylum processing, allowing ID and credentials to be matched. And so there are many ways in which technology is being deployed today, both in COVID and humanitarian settings, to be able to help the way people uh, live in those settings and, and those settings are managed. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, this very esteemed panel here today. And first of all, to go to Jawa to talk with us about this issue of payments and transfers in the monetary system, because it's been so important, particularly during COVID. Jawa. Of course. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jane, for the uh, brilliant introduction. So one of the pun intended ripple effect of this COVID crisis is obviously the uh, financial crisis. And we shouldn't forget the um, original incentive for blockchain to be created in the first place. That was um, over 10 years ago when the global financial crisis um, hit the world. Um, and today we're seeing a very similar situation where people are um, uncomfortable about you know, government controlling the monetary system and people showing distrust in in um, the current centralized monetary system. Um, blockchain really plays an important role in, in terms of democratizing this payment system. Uh, Ripple's XRP ledger is a great example uh, in the sense that in the XRP ledger, everybody can issue a currency in the format of IOU and trust is uh, established on a on-demand basis. You know, you can establish a trust line between two different nodes. Uh, we also see that um, there's a rise in um, currencies. Um, I wouldn't say replacing, but at least um, um, playing the role of uh, fiat currency in, in the crypto space. Um, a very important example is um, stable coins. So, um, in the early years, we've seen uh, stable coins in the format of custodial uh, stable coin. A very typical example is um, Tether. We all know Tether, but uh, we cannot forget that um, with Tether, at the end of the day, we still need to trust this third party. Stable custodial stable coins uh, such as Tether still is still subject to um, you know bank run risk and so on and so forth and this is really um, fascinating and uh, and it's it's for us really happy to see that there's now a surge in non-custodial uh, stable coins um, just um, these few years so a good example is let's say uh, market DAO. so non-custodian stable coins they are not um, uh, different from from custodial stable coins. They 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 are um, algorithmically backed by collateral, 
So um, uh, earlier we have, well, at the very beginning, we have in God we trust, and then probably we have in government we trust. And now in this technology um, era, it's really in numbers we trust. So everything can be, can be um, uh, um, you know, just uh, the, the, the mechanism can be, can be displayed, can be um, uh, constructed algorithmically in a very transpa transparent way thanks to um, the, the blockchain technology. Um, and we also see um, something like, uh, you know, special drawing right-like currency, such as, such as Libra, which is not connected to any single uh, fiat currency, but is backed by a basket of assets. Um, and as the technology evolves and as the, um, the mechani mechanism um, improves itself, uh, we'll see that the payment system and the monetary system will become increasingly more democratized thanks to the uh, distributed ledger technology. Thanks, Thank that's all, much. Jane. Thank you. And we have seen a rapid acceleration of mobile payments um, during COVID and, and some, you know, really interesting new examples as well, because, you know, people need to get remittances home to people in emerging economies, as well as people need to get foreign exchange. So I heard a great story uh, from the Philippines where micro entrepreneurs who do things like sell Netflix and Spotify cards, the cash shops are shut because of the lockdown. And so they've turned to crypto in order to be able to get foreign exchange to buy the Netflix and Spotify cards so they can keep working. So all around the world, particularly in emerging economies, we're seeing a real explosion of different uh, digital payments uh, for getting money to people in need. So thank you. That's a very fascinating and really important topic to be talking about particularly now because people really do need money. So let me move on to Surgeon because another locations and we'd love to hear more about what you've been doing and experiencing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it, it's sort of hard to I, I'm not going to redefine blockchain, but I'm going to insist on the on the fact that uh, contact tracing. There was a lot of debate in the in the technical community whether contact tracing can be made centralized or decentralized, or better say, can we rely on a technology yeah. such as smartphones in order to uh, to register and then later on uh, trace contacts among among people in some privacy preserving manner, but and that. Um, but that is still effective in in informing people fast if they were in contact with um, with infected persons, and so um, there were a number of projects that were started in this space, and uh, I was a part, or I am still a part of a DP3T project, which essentially built uh, a decentralized privacy preserving um, system, which. Um, registers contacts among among people but keeps the information about these contacts local to each person's phone and so it's a it's a wonderful example of a distributed system that fulfills its its function meaning contact tracing but at the same time protects people uh people's privacy in terms of who was in contact with whom and and it it also prevents uh authorities governments to to in, to invade people's people's privacy even if they have uh in the end access to some part of the of the of the information um and uh, the nice thing about these kind of systems is that they they do all the processing locally on the on the smartphone so it's in some sense we cannot say that this is a fully that this is a blockchain but there is uh, a lot of information that is stored on, that is distributed among among different parties. So there are uh, databases of of identifiers of infected people that are that get uploaded and then downloaded to each individual phone. So integrity is maybe not the main thing that we are trying to protect in this context. It's it's rather um, it's rather that we are trying to distribute the information about infected infected contacts to infected person to 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 everyone. 
Uh, so integrity is somehow protected in a centralized way in this in this system. So maybe in the future there there will be some projects that, that decentralize this component. But the um, but the important part of the distribution was the preservation of of privacy, which which is somewhat interesting because blockchains are not necessarily always good good for uh, for privacy, uh, as we as we know, since a lot of state is being replicated across a number of a number of nodes right so um i just i just wanted to bring this project up because uh, i i think we will see in the future and we already see a lot of submissions and a lot of projects trying to merge blockchains with uh, such privacy preserving um systems and uh, and and it's it's a and now just to go back to the to the example of this DP3T, right? It has been picked up by, by Google and Apple. They they essentially um, mentioned that that this design that we proposed is the one that they that they like. They implemented it within the Android and iOS operating systems, and it is essentially the basis of the um, exposure notification framework that now many countries have deployed, including Switzerland and and. Uh, um, and it's being deployed now in in the US. In Switzerland, we see now um, this system in, in use. So with over over one and a half million users uh, actively using this, uh, there is we see um, reports being being done. So there so the um, these uh, so infections are being reported, and people are also calling the hotlines because they have been informed by the system. So the system has shown utility. And uh, I'm hoping that it's it's going to be useful in the future. So, with that, I will close my my statement. That's perfect. It's going to be very interesting to actually see the results of research. Presumably, you're going to look at you know what happened and how it worked and so forth. Because uh, I mean, we had a contact tracing app here in Australia, which absolutely didn't work, never mind whether it preserved privacy or didn't, it just didn't work. And I think a lot of countries have got uh, apps that are not preserving privacy. And so I think this will be a fascinating one to continue to watch. So thank you for sharing I, I, the project I, I'm not, with us. Yeah, I, I will just respond to this with a with a short statement, right? Saying that, of course, it's a, it's a social issue as well, right? People need to need to adopt this technology. They need to trust it. I think in in Switzerland there there has been a lot of a lot of um, time invested in in making sure that people can trust this technology. But of course, it's um, it is not not easy to convince the population that that such a technology is uh, is worth it and and also privacy preserving. So. Well, look, I think there's a whole another debate to be had about privacy anyway, because on the one hand, we don't want to give that data to government. On the other hand, we give all our data away every day to everyone. So I think we need to redefine <laughs> privacy. But just before, Horst, you go on, Java, I'm just very conscious that you have a class to teach. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to maybe just give your punchy one-liner for technology in times of crisis, and we'll let you go and teach your class. Sorry, I think I muted myself. Thank you so much, Jane, um, for accommodating my schedule. Um, yeah, um, I guess one line conclusion. Um, um, well, we are looking forward to seeing what uh, what distributed ledger technology uh, can bring us in terms of uh, democratizing the, the monetary system. And I firmly believe that in the near future, um, every everybody, every single global citizen will have a say in uh, which monetary system they can, they can trust, which currency they can trust. And in terms of, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the valuation of the currency, they will have, they will also have a say in that, in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, voicing their vote in uh, the, 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 the weighting of um, the different component assets that are used to to back the um, the currency, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, thank I'll, you very I'll, much. I'll stay here for. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's it's fabulous. Thank you very much, and we, we're seeing 
you know, enormous movement in terms of uh, digital currencies and stable coins and central bank digital currencies. So we're, we're living in the middle of this story and we've yet to see how it's going to play out. But thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. And I wish I was coming to your class. I'm sure I'd learn a lot from you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank Horst, you, guys. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Thanks, Surgeon. Thank you, Horst. Thank you, Chava. Horst, um, thank you. I'm very forward to hearing from you because you know well before we were in the middle of the COVID crisis I've been studying and following how blockchain and technology are being used in humanitarian settings and in many ways similar to COVID because humanitarian settings are kind of a crisis situation then people have been more fast and more willing to embrace technology so Please share with us uh, the work that you're working on in humanitarian settings. Yeah, thank you, Jane. So many of those use cases that I'm currently researching have already been mentioned by the three of you. So anyway, it's good that I'm coming at the end. And the thing is, I'm a social science researcher and a management researcher. So my goal is to uh, summarize those cases and come up with the essence of them. So I've been researching the implications of blockchain technologies for a couple of years now. And currently, I'm working on this project that investigates the potential of a blockchain in times of crisis or disaster. And I have a special focus on humanitarian disasters. And the whole thing is research in progress. And uh, those are only initial findings. And I only have five minutes, so I have to be very concise. Looking back, I, I started doing research on blockchain around the year 2015, which is when it actually caught public attention. And initially, it created so many expectations that were highly exaggerated. And nowadays, I think everything is more realistic and more exciting use cases are coming up that are based on distributed ledgers. And uh, blockchain for disaster recovery is most probably one of the most exciting areas. I started my research project by first screening the existing literature for ideas on how blockchain can help humans in need. And I found plenty of those uh, good ideas and concepts. But in this research, I'm mainly interested in real world applications. And this reduced the number of cases quite a bit. Furthermore, I had to come up with a framework to assess the usefulness and the quality of the solutions. I spare you all the details, but uh, since I only have five minutes, but what, what I currently do is to use an assessment scheme to A, figure out what companies are exactly doing in case a disaster happens and how to help humans, and B, why they need blockchain technologies in the first place. My approach is not that I just collect information online, but I get in touch with the companies, I talk to them about the underlying technologies, I get additional material, and I summarize the positive and negative experience. So my goal is to filter out those solutions that depend on blockchain and cannot be done in any other way. Let me give you a couple of ideas here, which could serve as a teaser, and this is not a comprehensive list, of course. The first case that I documented is from Chainyard a company that supports the Miracle Relief Collaboration League with a blockchain solution that helps in the case of natural disasters such as hurricanes or floods. And their solution fosters collaboration, coordination among NGOs, and they use tokens to incentivize volunteers, among other things. And these are exactly the core features of blockchain that I'm interested in, or in other words, those are the use cases which, cannot, which you cannot accomplish with a traditional centralized database. Features uh, such as transparency and immutability are what I'm looking for. And this does not mean that a specific blockchain solution has to be 100% immutable, 100% secure, which would be impossible. But if there is a significant improvement to the status quo, that's an exciting use case for me. Another example that I identified is called Sika, which originates from Nepal and cooperates with World Vision. And they developed a blockchain-based solution that transfers digital assets through smart contracts in case a disaster such an earthquake has happened. And the only thing that is needed is a cellular network and of course smartphones. And transferring digital value is also a typical blockchain application and that's very close to the original use case of Bitcoin. And there's no way you can do this in the same manner with a centralized solution and without a tokenized system. And my final example is my NXG, a German-based technology company that has developed its own blockchain and I found then since they have created an app that helps to track and trace the spread of COVID-19, which we just mentioned. And in spite of being privacy compliant, they faced huge administrative hurdles that prevented the re release of the app. And the interesting thing, however, is that the use case can easily be transferred to other scenarios. 
for example, with a blockchain-based app that uses near-field communication, it would be possible to easily register hikers or skiers. So, for example, if an avalanche happens, for all the information about who is affected and potentially in danger would be immediately available. Of course, there are many other application scenarios, but in the interest of time, I have to stop here. If anyone is interested in the results of my research, or if you know a company that offers a blockchain-based solution for disaster recovery, I would highly appreciate if you would get in contact with me. And thank you. Thank you, Horst. Well, I'm going to be the first person who gets in contact with you, and I'm going to share with you my work on the different companies that are using blockchain and humanitarian. So, so we can certainly do that. So thank you so much. Um, but we can see from what you're saying that there are a whole range of different applications that people are using. And just going back to that, the intensity and urgency of the pandemic, what we've seen is a lot of those things that were previously only being used in humanitarian settings are actually um, being spread into much, much more widespread use now. So it's a, we could do a whole day on this topic. So let's share some more. And anyone in the audience who's interested, please uh, contact us. We've got only five minutes left or less. Um, I, Surgeon, are you still there? You, I can't see you any longer, but uh, he was under a tree, uh, but he may well have gone. I think he's yeah, gone. I think, I, I think we have two questions I'm, in the chat. Do you see that? Uh, I'm here, but I don't know what, uh, how do you? Okay, so it's, yeah, we do, we have a question which is around, to what degree do you think blockchain advancements during COVID will accelerate the transition from our legacy record keeping international system to a DLT model? Um, I would say it already is, but that's not necessarily going to be globally applicable but we're certainly seeing cases. So I'd just like to give Surgeon um, a minute to you to say some summarizing remarks and then Horst the same to you. And I'm so sorry, we'll be over. So Surgeon, would you like to say some closing remarks? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is a really exciting area. I think I think that uh, a lot of things were mentioned like democratization, like uh, relief, uh, uh, reforestation, you know, helping helping communities, and I think the in in lots of parts of the world, this kind of technology can um, can really help um, to to facilitate either the distribution of funding or or can uh, can help in uh, can help in boosting the the local communities. So I think it's it's exciting, and in the in, and overall, in the entire world, it can it can certainly help the privacy of the uh, of the people and um, and help build the trust into the into the governments and the communities. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for joining Hello? us. Uh, thank you very much for joining and us. And I have to leave and teach as well, so I will I will do that now. So thank you, Anne. Okay, brilliant. We're glad that you were with us. So, horse. Um, you've got about one minute to make a closing remark as well. Okay, I, I can just see that some questions are in the chat. Of course, unfortunately, we do not have time to answer them. But if there are any questions addressed to me, please send me an email. I would be happy to answer them in more detail. So my final remark would be that it's really exciting to see what's going out there, what's going on out there. We have now a technology in place that can do some things we could not do before. But everything is a very early stage. So the blockchain implementation that I've seen, they still had some issues. They were not fully distributed or they were still in an early stage of development, but we have some minimum viable products out there and the things that are really working. So I expect that there is going to be a transformation and blockchain or DLT will be a major driver for that. And it's really exciting to be part of that. And everybody out there, should, you should stay, uh, you should be aware of what can be done and you should be, aware of what's going to happen because this is one of the most exciting research areas and application areas of technology at the moment. Thank you very much. And, you know, we've seen that with COVID. We've seen that with humanitarian. Uh, Horst, I know that you and I would love to stay connected with each other and with other people Definitely. who are interested in this. We need to bring those stories out so you can actually see how powerful this can be in some of the most difficult settings in the world. So thank you so much for being on the panel. 
Um, I'm so glad that we managed to get the whole panel together and everyone's off teaching classes. So um, I guess I'll pretend I'm going to teach a class. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that we've really stimulated your interest in technology in times of crisis. So Horst, good night or good morning. Thank or you, Jane. Time of day. Uh, good day for okay. me, but thank you, Jane, for moderating this. And it was exciting to be part of this panel. A great panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Molin, and I'm a director in engineering at Ripple. Uh, I am very excited and uh, proud today to introduce um, our speakers. Um, we had two, two people who had sessions that were quite similar, so we put those together. And it's been incredible to work together and actually see how they benefited from each other's research. So our common topic is testing on the XRP ledger, but beyond the XRP ledger and how these, these um, methodologies can be used for, for many different applications in blockchain and blockchain applications. So I'll introduce to you uh, Mitchell first and then Kletos, which will take you through their presentations. Um, off to you, Mitchell. Thank you, Brad. Hello, everyone. My name is Mitchell Olstern, and I'm a PhD student at the Delft University of Technology. Yeah. OK. In part one, I will give an overview of our lab and highlight one of the projects we were working on. Our lab, C's lab, focuses on computational intelligence uh, for software engineering where we look at how we can use these CI techniques to automate software testing and other complex development tasks. Our lab consists of Anibale Panikela, who's our lab leader, Ari van Dersen, the leader of the software engineering group, Xavier Devoy, a postdoc working on search-based testing, myself working on testing for blockchain, and Puya Darakshanfar working on testing for cyber physical systems. Our lab mostly focuses on the following research topics, testing of blockchain, where our goal is to develop a novel automation technique uh, that scales to the complexity of blockchain-based systems, uh, test case generation, where we focus on uh, automation techniques that for revealing faults and triggering crashes in software products, AI-based penetration testing, where we do research into the security of web application firewalls, testing autonomous cars, where we find test scenarios that violate system requirements and hence uh, leading to software failures. And of course, when we find uh, faults or crashes in software products, these have to be fixed. So our last uh, research topic is uh, where we look into developing techniques to automatically uh, generate correct patches for buggy code. One of our new projects we're working on is using a log inference for automatic documentation and verification, where we use empirical methods to determine if the code behavior corresponds to what the program or application was designed to do. Uh, we started this project since we observed that with the ever increasing speed of development, um, it's quite challenging to keep the technical documentation of big software projects up to date. An example of this is the consensus protocol within the XRP ledger. There are many different versions of documentation for the XRP ledger. The first one being the Ripple white paper, which was updated in 2018, called Analysis of the XRP Ledger Consensus Protocol, 
which mostly highlights the theoretical aspects behind the protocol and how the protocol works on a higher level. Then we have the XRP Ledger website, which is the developer website who contains technical details about a bit more intricately how the consensus protocol works. And then we have the GitHub Wiki documentation, um, which contains more of the technical know-how of how the code um, achieves some of these objectives. Uh, however, it's not really clear which one of these is up to date because they also don't align uh, perfectly in all different uh, aspects of the documentation. So our main point is we want to see what's actually happening inside of the code and if this matches with the theoretical um, model that is set out by Ripple. Normally this is done through instrumentation. However, since Ripple is quite a big complex application, it makes it quite hard. And also since the application is uh, high performance, if we actually instrument the code, it might uh, impact how the code behaves. And of course, defeating the point of actually seeing what's happening inside of the code. So uh, we thought we can actually use the logs that Ripple produces to maybe see what's happening inside of the code. The Ripple daemon actually produces quite a lot of useful logs of different uh, severities uh, of log levels. So this can range from uh, only error messages to very detailed uh, messages of what's happening at each different stage. On the right, you can see a couple examples of what these messages look like. Um, yeah, so of course, to convert these logs into a model, we uh, use a tool called FlexFringe, which is a tool to, uh, to learn finite state machines. This tool was developed at TU Delft and it converts a specific log format called the Abadingo format to D of A. And it does this um, through making a prefix tree. So for example, um, this log format works with accepting and rejecting statements. So an ejecting statements, accepting statements indicates what will be a good uh, transaction through the program and rejecting statements will be what will be a bad transaction through the program. So in the case of the Ripple consensus protocol, we actually use the consensus rounds as one uh, trace to the program. So all the log messages that are produced within one round of the consensus are put on one single line and considered as an accepting state. And then we also add, add some rejecting states, which are um, lines that produce of, are different than the consensus rounds. This then is um, fed to the FlexFringe program, which then abstracts these behavior in a prefix tree and then tries to combine the different states that can be merged. And from this, we can then identify a model. Um, we performed a feasibility study in a bachelor thesis to see how the model that we created actually compares to the theoretical model set out by Ripple. This proved to be quite hard since the level of detail of these two different models uh, were different. The empirical model was quite detailed on the implementation side and has a lot of very specific details that were lacking in the theoretical model. The theoretical model only uh, discussed the major concepts happening in the consensus protocol. So you can see in a picture of what the theoretical model is that we deducted from the different documentations. In the red box, you can see the main uh, six steps of the consensus protocol. And above and below, you see the different edge cases that we derived. And here on the right, you can see the empirical model that we deduced from the log statements. We did this using the debug log level because we required, uh, we required a lot of detail to actually produce the intricacies of this model. And in this case, we only specifically focus on the consensus protocol. Uh, we did a preliminary evaluation of our model to see how um, good it actually represents the behavior of the code. We did it through calculating the recall and specificity of the model. Uh, in total, we, did, we uh, did 560 consensus round in our evaluations. The recall was 99.8%. For the specificity, we actually had to produce uh, new iterations of the logs to see if our model would either accept or reject this. We did it to mutating the logs we got from the validator through deleting some of the end, some of the log statements 
or are just swapping them around. With only one round of poor mutations, we got a specificity of 85%, which is uh, on the lower side than we wanted to, but was still a decent number. However, with two permutations, we're already at 97%, which is quite a nice result. From our evaluation, uh, we also observed that there were not really clear boundaries between the open and the liberation phase of the consensus protocol. This made it quite hard to uh, actually differentiate this stage in our model. Uh, so this is something we have to look into the future to maybe see how we can either add some locks to make this clearer or see if we can get some hints from different uh, lock messages. Another thing is that we observed is that in the theoretical model, uh, validation messages, which is basically the output of the individual calculation of each node, are only sent out when the ledger is on, uh, when the node is on the right ledger. And when the node is on the wrong ledger, this message should not be sent out. However, from the empirical model, we found out that this message is sent out regardless of which ledger the node is on. We assume this is mostly done for um, implementation reasons, and we don't see any, we don't anticipate any negative um, effects in the behavior of the code that we know of. Some of the challenges we're facing um, for our future work is the volume of lock messages. With the current level of uh, logs that we're using, it produce up to 100 gigs of logs a day, which is quite a lot of volume to go through. Something we also want to focus on in the future is uh, finding the edge cases. Since, of course, we use the live logs from a validator, these validators perform normally, uh, and it's quite hard to find the edge cases if they don't actually happen in the code. So for that, we might want to cover different uh, synthetical scenarios that we can use to create logs with. Another thing we want to look at is real-time log analysis, where we can use the logs to guide a search algorithm to, for example, do system-level testing. And eventually, we also want to work together with the Ripple engineers to maybe use this empirical model uh, to verify the behavior of the code in an empirical way. Uh, our approach mostly focuses on one single node, so the behavior of one single node. However, since um, finding these edge cases is quite difficult, we, we need some way to uh, create different synthetical scenarios, and currently this is still in prom. However, our next speaker, speaker Klitos, has an amazing, amazing um, framework that he's going to explain to you next. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is Klitos Christodoulou, and uh, I will be presenting the second part of the presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Mitchell, for this great presentation and for making the introductions. One of the main goals of UBRI is to promote collaboration and initiatives between individual researchers, project teams, and universities in general. And I believe that uh, in a, the overlaps between the, your work and our work, I think that uh, UBRI has succeeded in reaching that goal. And we're looking forward to be working together. Uh, so um, next slide, please. So a few, a few words with regards to our laboratory. Um, um, as I've said, Kilos uh, Christodoulou, I'm the research manager at the Institute for the Future. I'm also leading the DLRC, the Distributed Ledgers Research Center. Uh, a few words about the lab. What we are doing, we are focusing on applied research. And we are matching this academic kind of philosophy with tangible results uh, to open challenges. Along with me today, I have my colleagues Ilias Yosif, Antonio Singlezagis, and Marius Tulubu, that uh, they will also be answering questions with regards to the technical parts of this presentation. All the tangible results that we produce as artifacts of our research and our methodologies are uh, open source for everyone to observe. Uh, you can guide yourselves to our GitHub repositories and observe the branches there. We are also releasing from time to time a series of medium, medium like articles uh, summarizing our objectives and our results, especially the preliminary ones. 
And you can find more details with regards to our laboratory in our website at the University of Nicosia. So uh, next slide, please. So um, just an overview of our roadmap and our experience uh, for this particular project that we will be discussing today, benchmarking the behavior of blockchain protocols. Uh, it all started a year and a half ago uh, once we have been members of UPRI, we've started experimenting with our report validator and we are also maintaining a validator to the main XRP ledger here at the university. We have also built our own uh, private network and we have been experimenting with the, the RPCA version of the algorithm, the consensus algorithm. Uh, then at, at phase two, we started working on introducing with some synthetic scenarios some uh, fault, uh, faults and malicious uh, attacks to the consensus and trying to measure the behavior of the network. Uh, this allowed us to um, observe interesting um, outcomes and on the behavior of the RPCA uh, consensus algorithm. And this led us to our research paper that was published as a general paper at the beginning of this year and we have confirmed the result that the centralization decree and the relaxation of that centralization decree within the UNL node could only be possible up to a certain degree. And during our exploration uh, to this space, uh, we've realized that it's, it's, it's hard for developers and also researchers, uh, you know, be, before we do any, any research, before we examine any hypothesis, it is often a challenge uh, just to get your, you know, your private network spin up in a private environment and a controlled environment so that you can experiment on it and derive some conclusions. So we started the implementation of a, of a framework, of a benchmarking framework that will automate this process to deploy, uh, to test a network and also to monitor uh, various, uh, you know, data from, from the network nodes. So, um, moving to the next slide, um, we have identified several challenges, and this was as a result of the blockchain trilemma. Uh, we've been in the space, um, and we've seen that uh, due to the blockchain uh, trilemma discussions, many project teams uh, have been working towards implementing their own blockchain protocols, trying to uh, you know, uh, find an equilibrium between the three dimensions, scalability, security, and decentralization. And this has triggered within the ecosystem a variety of tools, libraries, and SDKs. Uh, however, this heterogeneity between the protocols has created significant challenges to, you know, in order to experiment with these networks, you need to get them spin off and, you know, bootstrap them and be able to create some synthetic scenarios in a controlled environment. So uh, we've seen that this is, uh, this is a challenge. That is also most of the times broken documentation out there and the code changes rapidly and therefore it's very hard to monitor the, these changes and understand uh, the code. Uh, so our solution to the next slide, uh, we are proposing a one-click Docker-based deployment of various blockchain protocols and topologies. We have created our own frameworks and make easy the process of spinning out and bootstrapping a blockchain protocol. And we have developed our own uh, modules for creating synthetic scenarios, simulating traffic, generation of wallets, observing how the consensus algorithm reacts, uh, how it reacts to fault tolerance, um, and in general, uh, through this framework, you can stress test the protocol, uh, transaction throughput, etc. And we have a module for monitoring, you know, uh, uh, pushing some data to a database that we can do some further, you know, exploration and infer insights from this data and do have some data analytics. So our solution is to have a generic benchmarking framework uh, which has a plug-and-play modular design. We have been working on our standardized JSON syntax for generating these scenarios, for creating uh, 
you know, uh, testing workflows and using using the framework. Um, moving to the next slide, please. Um, this is an abstract view of our framework. It currently consists of four modules. Uh, we have the control and configuration module for, you know, uh, creating the workflows and the synthetic scenarios. Uh, we have a module there for creating the nodes, uh, spinning up the nodes and, you know, the consensus algorithm. Uh, we have the account management and traffic generator for simulating traffic and generating accounts, uh, creating some, you know, throughput throughout the network. And we, we have been also been working on a monitoring service so that we can record some data in a database and use those data to do some, you know, data analytics on some data, on this data. And, um, and from there, our vision is to create, uh, you know, um, some metrics for observing the network and making decisions. Um, towards the next slide, uh, we have been instantiating this uh, framework with the repo daemon. Uh, our aim there is to is that with using the, the framework, we are able automatically to deploy the network topology and uh, the number of nodes and validators, config them in a list, etc. Create some accounts and you know generate some traffic. And also we have been, been we have been working on the monitoring framework for the XRP ledger and uh, we have been capturing data. We are currently in the process of creating our own health indicators as metrics for evaluating the performance of the, of the validators. Our aim is to propose a mechanism for dynamically updating the UNL list based on those metrics on the health of each validator that we will be monitoring. And uh, moving to the uh, next slide, um, just to highlight the fact that everything that we do is open source for the community in general. We, we are excited to be working with Ripple and uh, you know, other partners, and we are open to other collaborations. Feel free to explore our repos. Um, along with this slide deck, we, we are also uh, have some complementary material. We have prepared a demo presentation that showcase uh, a walk through the tools that we've developed. And there is also an interactive demo video for uh, anyone interested in, you know, in learning how this works. And um, towards the last slide, uh, for future work, uh, we are looking into expanding the expressivity of our synthetic scenarios so that we can create more complex scenarios and workflows. Um, to integrate this, uh, you know, Docker environment into a Kubernetes platform so that we can also test this in a more scalable manner. Um, still, we are working on, um, on finalizing the uh, in, in interconnections with other protocols, such as Ethereum and Bitcoin, and uh, various test cases there we have. Uh, on looking on which data is important for us to observe. Uh, we have been also providing a scrapping method uh, for our monitoring services, and we are improving on that as well. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you all for listening, and we are ready for the Q&A session. Okay, Great. I have Thanks, a uh, Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I have a question for, for you both. Uh, but before my question, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, your work is super cool, and thanks for joining us today. Um, my question is, uh, have you guys thought up about how you can apply this work you've done to other blockchains? I think, Kiros, you already mentioned that it's in the roadmap, and if so, uh, what will be the next blockchain that you'll be working on? Thank you for the question. Actually, we've been working with our own private implementation of the Ethereum protocol. Uh, so um, we've done uh, quite a few uh, work on experimenting with, with Ethereum. So we have 
adapted our scripts and our modules uh, to spin up an, uh, an Ethereum uh, uh, network uh, with all the specificities and the types of uh, nodes there. Um, and uh, we are, you know, experimenting with other networks, uh, private networks, um, so that we create an environment where uh, it's more controlled for our experiments and also to be able to do a bit of benchmarking. So how these networks are performing on the same task and if we can drive some metrics and you know their performance on the consensus or on how do they, re they react in you know high throughput of transactions, uh, speed latency, and also the you know uh, the consensus in general how how it reacts. So that's that's the aim. Um, everything that we do, we push it uh, in our GitHub repos. So if uh, if uh, there are teams out there that they would like to work with us to expand our framework to other protocols, uh, please feel free to to reach back to us. Okay, thank you. And for, for the audience, in one of those repos, there's a video, uh, a demo of you guys, uh, yes. Kiros. If anyone can yes, yeah. can YouTube and, and watch it, I recommend you do that. Exactly, there is a video there um, for those people interested to get in a hands-on experience on the tools that we've created. Um, so feel free to uh, watch that video. And from our side, we are also looking at uh, applying our tool to different blockchain networks. Currently, we also happen to be looking at Ethereum, um, and we also plan to look at others in the future. But currently, for our feasibility study, we are currently only looking at Ripple. Okay. Thank you, guys. Great, guys. Um, you know, again, as I said, to op when we opened up, um, when you guys first met each other, it was obvious you could benefit from each other's, from each other's resource, from each other's research. Um, Mitchell, you know, what kind of time do you think you could have saved uh, if you had had Cletos's project, and or and maybe some more details on how you could have, how you think you could have used his work, his team's work. That was actually a really good question. Yeah, for us, it was like quite a big challenge uh, since we were, of course, looking at the performance and the testing of one single node. Um, that, of course, these single nodes, they need to, to observe the behavior that we want to test and, of course, to document. It's quite difficult to create these different scenarios. So what we, in the beginning, did was more of a bit of like hacking it around. So setting up like mini test networks to um, to, to create this kind of synthetic behavior. But we noticed we were spending a lot of time on this, which of course is not our focus of the research. Um, so indeed with the tool like Cletus created, it would save us a lot of time to only focus on only our task and especially creating a complex network with all different kinds of scenarios can, can be in, insanely complex to create, especially with all the networking involved, encryption, um, so indeed, it would save a lot of time. So we have a question from the audience um, wondering, did you find any surprises when you ran your tests? So I, I figure this one is for, for Mitchell, since, but I guess both of you could, could address this. I'm not really sure what they're referring to, tests. Kletos, do you find any, do you find any surprises? Sure. So basically, one of the challenges that we have been finding uh, with regards to the first instantiation of the of the framework that we developed for the report case is how to serve the different UNLs, UNL topologies within the network. Uh, so uh, that was a challenge for us, and we managed to overcome this after a lot of trial and error. Um, so as, as Mitchell said, um, we've also highlighted the fact that in order for a researcher or for a team to be able to focus on a research hypothesis, a specific, specific research hypothesis, you need to have an environment, a control environment that you can run with tests and have the right you know, uh, mechanism for generating data in order to bootstrap your methodologies, your experiments, your evaluations, etc. And that was the main challenge that we also faced with 
other research projects related to blockchain and having uh, we thought that contributing to the community with a framework which is quite generic and at the same time flexible into bootstrapping these various uh, blockchain protocols would be beneficial for you know people that they are experimenting in laboratories saving them precious time to do their actual research uh, instead of you know playing around with the tools and the libraries and you know making sure that every, every piece uh, fits together great um so you know i um i think we just have a couple of minutes left and i just wanted to give some you know closing closing comments here looking at at both of your your projects and how important doing this kind of work is and you know one of the one of the things people assume in, in blockchain technology is uh you'll make something open source and people will vet it for you and say that it that it works and it's secure and you know this is something that you know i think we can challenge and say are you really going to have i don't think david schwartz is sitting around vetting other people's blockchain solutions on the weekend uh, actually he may contradict me on that maybe he does do that for free because <laughs> he enjoys it but uh you know in general we need tools like you gentlemen are are creating with your teams and you know, Mitchell, what you're doing, I see, I've seen this, you know, over the years, white papers differ greatly from the implementation. And even the people who have done the implementation couldn't tell you the differences. And we, we need a programmatic way of developing a solution like you're doing. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect, it's a perfect solution. And, and in our conversations, Mitchell told me things that were happening that I assumed did not happen because the white paper that I, I read before I started at Ripple said said otherwise. And and Kletos, I think again on your your project, people use modeling quite a good deal. And they're not actually using the solutions. And I think you you're gonna come up with much more credible results because you're not just using modeling software, you're actually spinning up spinning up these environments. I and mean, there's a huge difference. And, and some of the things you're doing, actually, we did in the early years of Ripple through through modeling, and it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, and there was no test, there was no test net, and, and the, the tools weren't available like they are now to do what you're to do what you're doing. Um, but you know, the the need there and to spin up different networks with different U, UNL lists is is incredibly important. Um, so uh, you know, again, really excited and um, again proud to see you know over the five or so years I've worked at Ripple how far it's come and to have people of your caliber um, working on on the XRP ledger um, again really really makes me proud thank you guys so much so much for your time thank you so much thank you. and I hope host that I've hit the time here and if not I believe we are done Thank you, guys. That was awesome, guys. Thanks, Brett, for a fantastic session. And, and welcome, everybody. I'm Cassie Craddock, and I'm a sales director here at Ripple. Over the last three years, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of financial institutions to help them build their own payments network. These financial institutions have the same common goal, to provide their customers with a global and real-time payment experience but often run into a number of challenges that stop them from being able to expand efficiently. If you think about what building a payments network actually looks like, it's first that you have to go and build relationships with financial institutions around the globe. You have to knock on the door, you have to hope that they want to do business with you, and that in itself can be a long and painful process. Once you've done that, you then have to figure out how you're going to interact with these um, institutions from a technical perspective. And while you may want to grow, there are often limitations with the technical resources that are available. And then finally, um, once you've built relationships, you um, have integrated their APIs, then you have to think about how you're going to pre-fund those positions or manage liquidity with these partners. And that can be an operational challenge and a cash management nightmare. So today I'm going to walk you through a demo of our on-demand liquidity solution. 
We're going to use a real life example of Annette who wants to send payment to her mum in the Philippines, um, Rosa. So Annette opens the Fast Remit mobile app and um, she wants to send 50,000 pe uh, pesos to her, her mum. She selects her mum as the contact. And at this point, um, Fast Remit are doing their initial um, checks from a validation and screening perspective um, to make sure that, that from their perspective that they fulfilled all their, um, their regulatory requirements. They then call, they then request a quote from Sprout Bank. So here they're looking for how much is that payment going to cost from an FX and a, and a payment perspective. And they then present that back to um, Annette. So here you can see um, Annette, um, the, what the exchange rate is. So 76, 89 PHP. And that total cost to Annette will be 650 pounds and 50 pence. So Annette selects, um, confirms the transaction and the payment is sent. So in the meantime, Fast Remit um, are, are sharing that payment information with Sprout Bank. And Sprout Bank are going through a validation and, and a, sc a screening on that payment information. And just to note here that there, there's been no physical commitment of funds. So what we're looking for in this, this transaction is to ensure that Sprout Bank have fulfilled all their requirements from a regulatory perspective um, and they, they have the correct payment information to make sure that payment is successful. So then we lock in the quote and Fast Remit then initiates the payment. And this is where on-demand liquidity um, really kicks in. Um, so we're using XRP here as the bridge currency and we're sending it across the XRP ledger that allows a payment time of about three seconds. Um, and we, we're providing the customer with an FX, a synthetic FX quote through XRP. Um, so GBP XRP, XRP PHP, and that physical movement of, of funds to, to Sprout Bank happens in real time. Sprout Bank are notified that the uh, digital exchange in the Philippines has received those funds um, and that they, that they can complete the, the last mile of the payout. So here, um, Sprout Bank will be forwarding on to, um, to a bank account or, or a cash pickup um, in the Philippines. So Rose is happy, her funds have been, uh, she's received her funds in real time. Um, and we've also been able to provide a net back, um, a, a notification to say that she has received those funds um, and that that end-to-end -end experience is, is around about two to three minutes. So thanks everybody for, for listening today. That's our on-demand liquidity demo for remittances. And to summarize, RippleNet makes it easier to run a high-performance cross-border payments business by eliminating pre-funding and using XRP as a bridge currency. If anybody would like to um, have a chat about sales at Ripple or to, um, to have a discussion about what we've um, spoken about today, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Now I'm going to hand over to our friends at the NUS FinTech Society and I hope you enjoy their presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Casey, for the demo on on-demand liquidity. Cool stuff. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So we are students from the National University of Singapore's FinTech Society, and we will be presenting on projecting the adoption and environmental sustainability of blockchain-based digital assets. So before we discuss um, the future projections, let's perhaps start with understanding where we are today. And it has been 11 years since someone, or rather a group of people by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, published a Bitcoin white paper. And it describes a revolutionary way to create an internet of value. So since then, the cryptocurrency market has grown exponentially. Bitcoin's on-chain transaction volume has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of nearly 400%. On the other hand, Ethereum has grown at a CAGR of 427%, while XRP has grown at nearly 240%. It has not only grown in volume, but in recognition as well. On the regulatory side, governments and central banks around the world are slowly realizing the benefits of blockchain technology. 
We have China with its central bank digital currency, Facebook Libra, and US banks slowly getting approval to offer crypto custody services. We also tried to quantify the rate of adoption using the base model of technological diffusion. And it appears that adoption has yet to peak. And there's potential for much further adoption, even for the two largest cryptocurrencies. And one point that we would like to note here is that this model relied on historical numbers from a period that was not particularly crypto friendly compared to today. And this is likely to be an underestimation on many aspects. So the prospects of further levels of adoption sounds like great news for fans of digital assets. However, let's not forget the process behind such uh, maintenance of distributed assets. So looking above, you do see a Bitcoin mining farm and these farms consume large amounts of energy. And how large exactly? Well, in ju just the past three years, the estimated amount of energy used by major cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin has exceeded the total amount of energy Singapore used in 2018. In fact, we could possibly use twice that amount just this year. So this large energy requirement would mean that there'll be significant carbon emissions arising from continued usage. For context, the United States released about 0.99 tons of carbon dioxide for every terawatt hour of electricity produced. And if we're hopeful for a future with greater cryptocurrency adoption, then we have to prepare for a future with greater carbon emissions caused by cryptocurrencies as well. So the important question here is, how do we go about projecting cryptocurrency adoption? And then from there, how do we guess its energy usage? So perhaps we can start by showing how not to project adoption and sustainability. Right. So firstly, we can't use a rolling average growth rate because the initial years of cryptocurrency adoption saw exponential growth. In fact, if we use this rolling average, on-chain transaction volumes can hit 1 billion times global GDP in 2030. So we need to dial down our growth forecast. An exponential decay model to project growth rates allows us to show a scenario where the growth rate eventually tapers down across time. However, this creates more questions than it answers. Why an exponential decay? Why a factor of 0 0.8? And is 60% of GDP too high an estimate or is it too low? So we do need some form of historical data to base our growth projections on to make it seem realistic and grounded in reality. As such, we decided that the closest thing that we can actually use to project future crypto transaction volumes would be the historical growth rates in credit card transaction volumes. So this allows us to come up with a much more conservative estimation of future transaction volumes. And even with these lowered and realistic numbers, we will potentially end up using 3.51 times the amount of energy that Singapore used in 2018 in 2030. So that is about 177.15 terawatt hours of energy, or maybe 175 tons of CO2 if we use the current CO2 emission rates of the United States today. And for illustrative purposes, it is estimated that we need to plant six trees to move one ton of carbon dioxide over a period of 100 years. So 175 tons of CO2 emitted because of cryptocurrencies require us to plant 1,050 trees every year to offset the carbon emissions. Next, Cody will now share about how there's great unpredictability in forecasting future adoption because of the many catalysts and inhibitors that can increase the inaccuracy of already inaccurate estimations. So thanks, Larian. So for the very first inhibitor of adoption is one of security and trust. So as you can see from the timeline, there has been a series of high-profile cryptocurrency hacks. And this allows hackers to steal large amounts of cryptocurrencies. So more hacks means lower trust. And this was supported by an economist survey with 32% of respondents cited the lack of security as the second highest barrier to adoption. At the same time, we also have to recognize the immutability nature of crypto. Yeah, it's cool that transactions are irreversible, but what happens if users are callous? They forgot their passwords, their usernames, they can't log into their accounts. It means that their funds are permanently gone and lost. And as for criminal transactions, once these occur, it becomes irreversible. So next for infrastructure, we look at social in terms of education. The Economist has found that cryptocurrencies require some level of competencies, which possibly poses a high barrier to entry. And this is a huge problem, especially in the less developed countries, because they suffer from illiteracy. 
where 50% of the population lack basic computer skills. At the same time, research also points that more banks, more financial institutions, they tend to attract more fintech development and more crypto networks. But of course, in these LDCs, this is something lacking, especially in the unbanked communities. In terms of physical infrastructure, internet connectivity is required for crypto services. But worryingly, as of 2019, only 19% 19 of individuals in the less developed regions are online. And finally, for political, we all live in this tense geopolitical scene, especially the yo-yo diplomacy right now is in between US and China. So we've seen how political relations can influence the government support of ideals and policies. So there exists a possibility on the politicization of crypto where, yeah, China's crypto network works really well, but the US simply refuses to adopt it. So all these really present an uncertain future and its swing adoption rates. But on a more positive note, there are catalysts which may drive adoption. First, crypto services acting as attractive exchange systems, where right now in the international remittance market, there are multiple financial intermediaries, multiple financial corridors, and it's such a long and expensive process. So crypto can enhance the affordability through smart contracts, where it fosters transparency in negotiation, reducing bargaining costs, and deters bridge through immutability, reducing enforcement costs. So this can be seen in MPs in Kenya, where you know they use Bitcoin, they charge lower rates, and that's why they have attracted so much hype in that region alone. So next is crypto acting as financially inclusive networks. Right now, banks impose a strict variety of, requ of requirements and a lot of identification documents just to open an account. And yet the poor, they lack this proof of identity. So crypto offers that decentralized approach of identity management. And what that means is all you need is just a phone and an internet connection. So for example, coins like PH in Philippines, you know, all you need is just your phone number and possibly a selfie of a government ID just to open an account. And so this easy and accessible process has attracted over 5 million users, especially from the unbanked communities. And finally, crypto acting as alternative forms of value. First, the emergence of stable coins, which is crypto packed to stable assets, and that's why they have that price stability. And research has shown that some stable coin pairs are more stable than half of the G20 fiat currency pairings. And not just that, there has been rising recognition by banks like JP Morgan and the JPM coin, which has attracted a lot of attention in the international banking network. And finally, as what Larian said, in the US, they just passed a regulation in July this year, which allows banks to offer custody services. So there is increasing recognition for crypto as an inherent form of value. So with that, these are the recent trends which may drive and inhibit adoption rates. And next up, Samuel will just take us through the environmental impacts of adopting cryptocurrencies. Thank you, Colin. Now that we have a better understanding of projecting adoption, let's turn our attention to the environmental impacts of adopting cryptocurrencies. So firstly, we believe that cryptocurrencies' environmental impact can be split into two types, its endogenous and exogenous impact. Exogenous impact includes all external activities that occur as a result of cryptocurrency adoption, such as reduced carbon emissions from traditional forms of cryptocurrency due to cryptocurrency substitution. On the other hand, the endogenous environmental impact of cryptocurrencies considers any activities that facilitate a cryptocurrency's transaction and its respective carbon emission. While both types of environmental impact are significant, for today, we'll be focusing on the endogenous side of things. What we'll do is propose an ideal model for the endogenous environmental impact of cryptocurrencies and highlight the limitations of providing accurate estimates in today's context. Through this mini exercise, we aim to provide a high level view of the different factors involved and hope that this will serve as a guide for how one would estimate and project the endogenous environmental impact of certain cryptocurrencies. There are four main equations in our model, all of which are on a per transaction basis. Starting from the top, we have carbon emissions per transaction. Next, we have carbon emission from electricity consumption, followed by electricity consumption per transaction. Lastly, we will look into electricity consumed per transaction for a particular cryptocurrency. As you can tell, each equation is nested within the equation above. Now that you have a rough overview, 
let's dive deeper into each equation and peel back different layers of the model. Our higher level equation is carbon emission per transaction, and there are many different factors that feed into it. The two biggest sources of cryptocurrency carbon emission comes from the generation of electricity and the production of materials used in mining equipment, such as rare earth metals. Lastly, we have an error term that should take into account any other indirect carbon emissions. Now let's peel back the first layer and discuss more about the carbon emissions from generating electricity. We believe that the carbon emissions from electricity consumption is the multiplication of electricity consumed per transaction, which is in kilowatt hours, and the carbon emitted per kilowatt hour. Now, what are some difficulties faced in estimating such numbers? Firstly, different countries have different energy production methods. Some methods, such as solar or hydro, emit less carbon than more traditional forms of energy production. Adding on to this, cryptocurrencies are designed to be pseudo-anonymous. As a result, it is very difficult to identify the location of miners and where they draw their electricity from. Hence, in order to obtain a sound prediction of carbon emission per cryptocurrency transaction, we would have to first determine a reliable estimate of current carbon emissions. Let's move on to the third equation, electricity consumed per transaction. What we want to consider is the average electricity consumed. For this, we will be taking a simple average of the electricity consumed by each active cryptocurrency. Now, a weighted average based on its adoption can be used as well, but let's dive into the current challenges faced when estimating these numbers. Different consensus models require different amounts of electrical consumption. For example, proof of stake or proof of authority models are known to be greener compared to proof of work models. Secondly, because of the relatively unregulated nature of cryptocurrencies and accessibility of cryptocurrency development tools on the internet, the total number of active cryptocurrencies is constantly changing. Now let's zoom in on the electricity consumed per transaction for a particular cryptocurrency. We propose that it is a function of the hash rate of the cryptocurrency and the efficiency of the mining equipment used. In addition, there are also secondary energy consumptions such as running the cooling systems used by the miners. So what challenges do we face? First of all, different mining equipments have different mining efficiencies and as a result, different electrical consumption. Given the rapid development of better semiconductors, earlier calculation methods may not be that relevant for future project projections. Secondly, it is very difficult to predict hash rate and it is a function of price, which we all know is something very difficult to predict. Last but not least, secondary energy consumption that goes into mining should not be ignored and more research needs to be done on this. Now that we have peeled the onion, we hope that this exercise will shine light on the difficulty faced in modeling environmental impact of cryptocurrencies and highlight the various aspects which require more research into. Now I'll pass the time back to Larian to conclude our presentation. All right, thanks Samuel. So now to wrap up our presentation, we would like to summarize our key findings that we have found throughout our research. So firstly, the nascent fear of cryptocurrencies means that there aren't established valuation models that are widely accepted by the market yet. So more research needs to be done to develop such pricing models. And this is largely because mining and future adoptions are economic activities and are greatly influenced by the prices and expectations of prices. Next, while we may not be able to reliably predict the future adoption of cryptocurrencies today and thus their environmental impact, what we can do today is to develop greener and more energy efficient digital assets for the future. And lastly, we would also like to stress that um, viewing adoption is a slow and gradual process. Current blockchain solutions will only improve and get more efficient with multiple iterations over time. Crypto adoption is a marathon and not a sprint. And last but not least, our team would like to give a special mention to Shay, Senior Data Scientist at Ripper, and Professor Keith Carter from the NUS FinTech Labs for the guidance and assistance in our research. And this is just a quick snapshot of the diverse group of students behind our research into the adoption and environmental sustainability of blockchain-based digital assets. Thanks, everyone. So thanks again, everyone, for listening to our presentation. And I hope we have left some form of insight into how important it is to begin adopting green alternatives for blockchain-based digital assets today. 
And if you find our presentation interesting and insightful and you'd like to know more, the full research paper we made available online soon. Alternatively, do feel free to reach out to the NES FinTech Society on LinkedIn. And once again, thank you and I hope you guys have a great day. That's a wrap for this segment, and thank you to all our speakers, and thank you to the audience for some great engagement. For those of you who are joining very late, thanks for staying up and for the guests around the world. We hope it was an informative way to start your day. I know I learned a lot. We'll be back at 8.29 Pacific time in the morning and others during the evening to kick off some more blockchain and crypto-focused content, including keynotes from Ripple CTO David Schwartz, BitPay CEO Stefan Pear and three former Treasury employees on central bank digital currencies and Ripple special advisor Zoe Cruz hosting a panel on digital asset adoption. We'll hope you join us. Thank you and see you soon.